wins it in the eighth inning. This play by Darrell Evans. The key defensive play. Tonight, we salute the man who led the Tigers to their World Series victory. Detroit Tigers manager, Sparky Anderson. From the Renaissance Center, it's the second annual Salute to Excellence. Honoring Detroit Tigers manager, Sparky Anderson. Hosted by Detroit's favorite personality, Dick Curtin. And featuring an exciting lineup of Sparky's friends and admirers. San Diego Padres manager, Dick Williams. World champion boxer, Thomas Hearn. The Detroit Symphony Orchestra's Gunter Herbig. Hall of Famers, Al Kaline and George Kell. Major League umpire, Rocky Rowe. Olympic baseball coach, Rod Dado. Comedian, Joe Bolster. NBC sportscaster, Joe Garagiola. Beverly Hills cop, Gil Hill. Tigers broadcaster, Ernie Harwell. WDIV's Mort Trim. Tigers owner, Tom Monahan. Columnist, Bob Talbert. Tigers pitcher, Milt Wilcox. Comedian, Robert Wall. Tigers president, Jim Campbell. WDIV's Al Ackerman. Tigers vice president and general manager, Bill LaJoy. Columnist, George Ketter. WDIV president and general manager, Amy McCombs. And our special guests, the 1984 world champion, Detroit Tigers. The Salute to Excellence is brought to you in part by Light Beer from Miller. Everything you always wanted in a beer and less. And by Chevrolet, who we'll invites you to see today's Chevy, drive today's Chevy, live today's Chevy. And by MCI, savings on calls from coast to coast. We sound better to business. And by your greater Detroit Midas dealers. Trust the Midas touch. And now, here's our host for tonight's festivities, Mr. Dick Parton. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, and welcome to the second annual Salute to Excellence dinner. Honoring uh, tonight, Detroit Tiger manager, Sparky Anderson. We honor tonight the excellence of Sparky Anderson, a man who has done something that no professional major league baseball manager has ever done before. Work with Al Ackerman for five years. <laughs> Sparky is the only manager ever to have won 100 games in both the American and the National Leagues. Also, Also to win a World Series in the National and American Leagues. And when you change locations as much as I do, you appreciate people who are successful in more than one place. <laughs> but we're here tonight to honor a man who has brought this city a world championship with just three little words. Bring in Hernandez. <laughs> Willie, uh, Willie signed for over $4 million, which they claim now is more than Denny McLean makes an in interest on a $2,000 loan. <laughs> but, uh, a lot of people think because Willie is now in the organization after all the confusion that he's going to speak tonight. Unfortunately, he is not. However, with the money that he's getting, uh, he has hired me to speak for him. So I will be... <laughs> tonight and he's hired you to laugh too so. <laughs> anyway why uh, why is Sparky one of the most successful baseball managers in the history of baseball and, and we all know that he is well uh, one of the reasons may be subtly after the Tigers uh, lost three in a row in Seattle the end of May you remember they went into Seattle 35 and 5 the best start any major league baseball team ever had they probably lost three in a row. They went from 35 and five to 35 and eight. Sparky was a little cheesed about that. You know, he doesn't take kindly to losing any time, but especially in that kind of situation. And so he penned a note and put it up on the clubhouse wall. And it read, 
There'll be two buses leaving the hotel for the ballpark tomorrow. The two o'clock bus will be for those of you who need a little extra work. The empty bus will leave at five. <laughs> I think to be a great baseball manager, you have to have a great baseball manager's name, like Sparky. What a great baseball name that is, Sparky. I mean, uh, I don't think it'd be good for a doctor, for example. Uh, you, wouldn't want, you wouldn't want the guy who does your open-heart surgery to be named Sparky. At least I would. You know, uh, you know, Dr. Sparky Schwartz to surgery. I mean, that's just... If I were laying there, I wouldn't be real pleased at that. And so George, Sparky Anderson, uh, came to Detroit back in 1979 after nine glorious years with the Cincinnati Reds. And I mean glorious. He was in the World Series four times, 70 and 72. They lost. They won in 75 and 76. And then uh, Sparky took his team in 77 and 78 to two second-place finishes, but apparently that wasn't good enough for the Reds, and he re was released and picked up with the Tigers in 79, and we are very, very thankful that the Reds did us that favor. Tonight, we are honoring excellence. We're honoring the achievements of a man who led a very talented group of players to the very pinnacle, the World Championship. But this evening, let's not forget the other excellence that we are honoring with this tribute, and that is an excellence of the two children's hospitals in Michigan. With your generous contributions of $125 a person to you people in the audience, you have shown your appreciation of these fine facilities. And tonight, you at home will also be able to contribute to these hospitals by a telephone system being manned to take your contributions. Throughout tonight's event, telephone numbers will be flashed on the screen, and your support will help to continue the work of C.S. Ma Children's Hospital in Ann Arbor and the Children's Hospital of Michigan in Detroit. But now let's talk baseball. In his book, Sparky says about Milt, Milt is the kind of pitcher that the hitters don't mind facing then they wonder what went wrong. Here's Milt Wilcox. You know, a lot of people think that Sparky's not too smart. Well, I, I know better. You know, I started my, my career in Cincinnati, in the Cincinnati Reds organization in 1968. Sparky wasn't in that organization at the time. I think he was with Montreal or somebody like that. But I guess he decided that he saw me over there and it was going to be a good organization. And he decided to come over in 1970. Well, it's history from then on what he did at Cincinnati. Uh, he turned in probably to be probably the greatest manager of all time with Cincinnati. And of course, at that time, not with the world as of yet. And then he, he did something that kind of upset me a little bit. He traded me. He traded me to Cleveland. But did he follow me to Cleveland? No. <laughs> Pretty smart. Then I get traded to Chicago Cubs. Did he follow me to Chicago? No way. Then I get traded to the Detroit Tigers. Did he follow me to Detroit? Yep. And what did he do? He won another world championship. Pretty smart thinking. Following me around. He knows where to go. I'll tell you. I'd like to get real serious for a minute. I've known Sparky since 1970 when we were with Cincinnati. And he's endured a lot of hard things in his career. They fired him in Cincinnati after he had lost. Can you, can you lose when you come in second place two years in a row? I guess they, they thought they did. And you've seen what happened to the organization since he's gone. And you've seen what happened to our, our organization since he's come over here. I think that's probably one of the smartest things that, uh, except for getting me over here, that Mr. Campbell's ever done. <laughs> But I would like to say a couple things about Sparky that, uh, all kidding aside for a while, that a lot of people don't realize. You know, we're uh, honoring, him, honoring him here tonight because of uh, children's hospitals here in Detroit. But it doesn't count of all the children's hospitals and all the people that he sees on the side during the season. I know, and Ernie Harwell does the same thing. But I'll be getting up at 10 o'clock in the morning to go down for lunch, I mean for breakfast or what it is, whatever it is during the season, and I see Sparky and a few other people, usually Ernie, getting ready to go out the door. And I'm wondering, you know, where are they going to go? They're going to go walking? Well, they've already been walking because they get up at 6 o'clock or 7 and go walking. 
They're usually going to uh, some children's hospital or some handicapped person's house on the road when they could be doing other things to give their support and their caring to these people. And this is something that you don't really see a lot of. You hear maybe a little bit about it, but Sparky does this in all the cities. And it's one of the biggest things that's made me really appreciate the guy other than watching him manage all the years that I had. And the, the, like Ernie says, the compassion and the caring that this man has for other people other than himself. And that's just one of the biggest thrills and one of the things that I would like for everybody to know that that's how Sparky Anderson is. He's a caring man and the best manager in the history of baseball. Thank you. Director Gunter Herbig and Tigers President Jim Campbell. Well, I'm about to introduce now the uh, music director of the Detroit Symphony Orchestra, former music director of the Berlin Symphony. It occurs to me that baseball managers and uh, conductors, orchestra conductors, probably share a common problem and that they have to show up for work every day because if they miss, people might figure out they don't need them anyway. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the music director conductor of the Detroit Symphony. <laughs> Here is Gunter Herbig. Thank you, Mr. Purton, for the kind welcome. <laughs> I'm sure most of you are wondering what a symphony conductor is doing as a tribute to a baseball manager. I must tell you, I'm wondering too. <laughs> First, I thought they wanted me here to represent Detroit's cultural community, but <clears throat> I am suspicious. I think Channel 4 simply realized that I am the only one on this podium who owns a tuxedo. <laughs> I was told that I was to speak tonight for a roast for Sparky Anderson. And one question came to my mind, what is a roast? <laughs> they told me that a roast is a banquet where they honor someone by saying rude things about him. <laughs> Other countries, other customs. <laughs> Since I, I know nothing about baseball at all, <laughs> I decided to do a little research on that game you call the great American pastime. And I must say, I'm not quite sure how you can tell this an American sport. I found out that the balls are made in Haiti and the clubs in Taiwan and that the best relief pitchers are from Mexico and from Puerto Rico and that the whole thing is financed by Italian pizza. <laughs> Sparky has never been to a symphony concert. <laughs> and I think there's a reason for this. Because his idea of classical music is Fat Bob singing the Star Spangled Banner. <laughs> Everybody knows that there are differences between what Sparky does and what I do. 
But surprisingly, we, had, we have not only differences, we have a lot in common. We both play very close attention to scores. <laughs> we both lead a very, very talented group of players. And And as I learned tonight, we both have English as a second language. <laughs> but I must be honest, the main reason I'm here tonight is to get even with Sparky. During September, I would go up on the podium knowing that there were some poor husbands forced to go to the symphony concerts by their music-loving better half, <laughs> who were secretly listening to the Tiger game on the radio. <laughs> so, Sparky, when you get up tonight to get your award, Rest assured that at least one person in the audience will be listening to the beautiful sound of the Detroit Symphony Orchestra. <laughs> Jim Campbell is the president of the Detroit Baseball Club, and he wanted to make an announcement tonight. The good news is there will be no increase in ticket prices at Tiger Stadium this season. All right. The bad news is there will be a two pizza minimum. Jim Campbell. Jim. Thank you, Dick. Really, this is the first time in five years that uh, I've been willing to come out and say that I'm the fellow that brought Sparky Anderson to Detroit. <laughs> In my book, he's one of the best managers. <clears throat> he's worked hard. He's worked hard all his life to develop his skills, and it hasn't always been easy. Sparky's a dapper guy, easy to get along with now, but believe me, there was a time in his life when seriously it wasn't that easy. He wasn't a beautiful baby. <laughs> In fact, when he was a little kid, two or three years old, he might be considered quite ugly. <laughs> when you laugh, it's not that funny. His mother used to hang a pork chop around his neck so his own puppy would play with him. <laughs> But he learned, he learned through those experiences to handle situations. I remember our first press conference with Sparky when we brought him into Detroit. Probably the biggest press conference we ever had for baseball. One of the first things Sparky said was that he considered me the best general manager in baseball. Pretty good. Pretty smart. I liked it. <laughs> Then he went on to say that we had three of the best left-handed hitters in the game. Rusty Staub, Jason Thompson, and Steve Kemp. <laughs> Then he passed some more compliments around. And he closed with this bomb, that within four years or five years or less, we would be world champions. And man, I was on the edge of my chair, everybody. All we needed, Sexy, was the band playing Stars and Stripes Forever. We'd have had, we'd have had uh, everything necessary at that point in time. This was something that uh, I'll never forget. But the bottom line is, he did it. And nobody ever questioned the fact that he asked me to get rid of Staub, <laughs> Thompson, Kemp, and then told the media that Jim and Bill and Rick were going to find him some left-handed hitters. <laughs> This didn't bother him a bit. 
but he did win. He's been a great fella, and to me, and I mean this sincerely, Georgie, probably as good a friend as I ever had in my life, and I think you'll always be that way. Thanks for honoring Sparky, and congratulations. And I know he means that, Sparky, even the day uh, comes when he fires you. Okay. Sparky Engine Jr. and you know Sparky's son, Sparky Little Sparky. How about uh, Whitey Ford? I'm his be Whitey. You know, well, you know, I, you know, I'm a manager in my own right. Of course, it's, you know, it's just a you know, hamburger stand, but no. but uh, we make an excellent malted. If you ever want a malted or a taco, perhaps for the wife or something like that. It's, Talbert's excited tonight. His book, Good Morning, is selling well. He's here with his Tiger heroes. First time I've seen Bob out of his Tiger jacket since opening day. He tried to find a tux with a big D right here, but couldn't do it. So he's here in a standard tux, and he's about to talk to us. Mr. Bob Talbert of the Free Press. Thank you, Dick. Has Sparky Anderson always been this way? That was the assignment Channel 4 gave me to find out if the man, as a kid, did he talk this way? How did he write? What was he like as a kid? And with the resources of the Detroit Free Press, our investigative reporting teams, we went to South Dakota grade schools, went to John Adams Junior High School in Los Angeles, and we came up with some of Sparky's old school papers and test answers. As I read them to you, you decide if Sparky Anderson has always been this way. After a history class, Sparky wrote, Patrick Henry always went around quoting famous sayings. He was always saying things like, give me liberty or give me death. Somebody finally give it to him. <laughs> you could tell that Sparky's wisdom was growing as he moved through junior high school. They had a class in ge geology, and he wrote, rocks are gradually softened through aging. The first hundred years of a rock's life are the hardest. <laughs> and the boy was really going good when he wrote this one. He says, the moon is more important than the sun because the moon shines at night when we need the light. <laughs> After a class in geography and they were studying about explorers, Sparky wrote, Magellan circumcised the world in a clipper ship. He was asked to describe what in a class is the words, give descriptions of the words, and the teacher asked him, what does the word nothing mean? Sparky wrote, nothing is a balloon with its skin off. <laughs> what does the word thinking mean? And young George Anderson wrote, thinking is when your mouth is shut and your head keeps on talking to itself. <laughs> Boo, you did that all year. Of all the things the Free Press reporters dug up on Sparky, I like this one the best. After a class in health, he wrote, an artery carries the blood to or from the heart. I forget which, but the body remembers, and that is the important thing. <laughs> Thank God Sparky's still that little boy. The little boy in us that goes to bed with his first brand new baseball game, baseball glove on, sleeps all night, all week, all month, all year with it. The little boy in us who thrills when a slugger hits a home run and runs the bases with his heroes. The little boy who dreams of a World Series. Thanks, Sparky, for giving us our childhood every summer. We love you in this town. Here is the Tiger General Manager and the man who concluded the deal with Willie. Here is Bill LaJoy. Bill? Thank you, Dick.
Sparky and I have been friends for a long time. We go back about 28 years, as Dick does with Sparky. I've watched Sparky over the years grow as a man, a person, and as a manager. He actually used to be very quiet, but he's learned to be an extrovert that it takes to be a successful manager and deal with the press and the things that go with it. To me, Sparky is a man for all seasons. He's devoted to his family, devoted to his team, devoted to each and every player, and he is very loyal to the front office. Sparky, I wish to salute you for the qualities that you possess, and I know that I am a better man for knowing you, and each man that comes in contact with you is also a better man. Thank you. Joe Bolster has appeared on the Tonight Show as well as uh, some of the top clubs on the East Coast. He has written a screenplay for Hal Holbrook called Girls Night Out. He is a favorite on the college circuit. And how about a nice Detroit welcome for Mr. Joe Bolster. Joe. Thanks very much. Thank you. How are you folks? Well, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I guess it's fair to say that uh, you probably haven't heard of me. Is that uh, fair to say? Yeah. Well, I'll, uh, I'll let you know a little secret. I'm not looking to be a big star in show business, and that's working out real good so far. <laughs> of course, you can probably tell from looking at me, I'm a little bit different from most black comedians. Uh, <laughs> I had to get a day job in New York to kind of supplement my comedy income. It's an interesting job. What I do is I work one of the local radio stations in Manhattan. Uh, what I do is I get in my car during rush hour and ride around and report on helicopter traffic. <laughs> it's going really... See, I don't have a good car. I have a 66 Rambler. Uh, this is not a great car. In fact, the other day I took it in for a repair. You ever do this? You take your car in for a repair and the dealer gives you a car to drive while your car is being repaired. This is called a loaner. I take in a 66 Rambler. The guy gives me an 84 Camaro. <laughs> What's my incentive to bring it back? <laughs> Certainly not the threat that he'll keep my car. <laughs> the guy calls me up. Your car is ready. I'm not. <laughs> I hope the 94 Camaro's are good, because that's the next time you'll be seeing me. <laughs> I like to drive in Pennsylvania. See, in Pennsylvania there on the turnpike, they have signs that tell you how much a speeding ticket's going to be, depending on how fast you're caught going. Have you seen these signs? They're supposed to slow you down. They don't work at all. I'm driving by going, sir, I can afford that. <laughs> and it got worse. I'm going 80. Some guy goes by doing 100. I don't want him to think I'm poor. I speed up. <laughs> Pretty soon the whole highway is doing 160 because of peer pressure. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sometimes when you drive and you pass funeral processions. I was in a funeral procession about two months ago. I never knew this. Did you know funeral processions are allowed to go through red lines? Why? What's the hurry? Seems to me this policy just creates more business. First runs a red, hit some poor guy going through the green, bang, put him in the back. Stack him if you have to. I like to ride around and listen to these radio call-in shows they have, you know, where people can call in and talk to the guy in the air. Doesn't it seem there's always one guy calling in who has no idea what's being discussed? And he always has some totally inappropriate comment to make. The guy goes, we're talking about the Mideast crisis, the Arabs and the Jews, one of the most explosive issues of our time. We want to know how you feel. The number's 525-1200. Hello, you're on the air. Yeah, how much should a hamster weigh? <laughs> <laughs> Sir, I don't think that pertains. Yeah, but mine's up to 78 pounds. <laughs> I think it might be a Wolverine. Huh? 
And some of those shows, they have a guest on who's so boring, your radio dial changes by itself. And the host is begging people to call in. Once again, that number in Europe is Dusseldorf 9, 4000. And we'll be talking about plywood for the next six hours. Stay with us. <laughs> well, it's good to be here, the honor of the Tigers. See, I'm from New York, and uh, we relate to some of your lean years here with the Mets. We had the Mets in New York, who so many years uh, were, were tough to root for. So many years when their magic number was pi. Uh, <laughs> To a Met game a couple years ago, there were 192 people at the game. I had my own vendor. <laughs> the guy's bugging me the whole game. Can I get you something? <laughs> Quiche? Anything? I'm here to serve you. It was an incredible game. Everyone at the game got a foul ball. People were strolling after foul balls. I'll get this one. <laughs> you hail the next one, because I'm tired of picking these things up. Man. Of course, in New York, we have the Yankees. The Yankees say the zoo compared to the other place. They got fights in the stands, people throwing things in the field. You hear strange announcements like, Vinny, report to the press box. We found your arm. Pick it up now if you can. In fact, they have so much fan violence at Yankee Stadium before the game starts to make a very weird announcement. The guy comes on a loudspeaker and he says, ladies and gentlemen, any spectator going onto the field during the course of the game will be escorted from the playing surface. Have you ever gone to a game and seen some idiot run out on the field? Do they escort him off? <laughs> Usually it's 60 cops with Billy Club wailing on his hat for 15 minutes. This announcement is misleading. It makes it sound like it's going to be the senior prom. I expect the cops come after the guy with a tuxedo and a corsage and go, shall we? Take it for a walk, left fielder has a tray of hors d'oeuvres and a party hand for you. Hi, nice to have you on the field. Mingle, try the dip at second base. And this year, I don't know if you know this, but this year, gang, the Phillies are celebrating their 100th year in the National League. And at one of the games this summer to celebrate, anyone who is 100 years old gets into the game free. How can they afford to do that? I mean, you are going to have 100-year-olds coming down by the busload. <laughs> and I'll tell you something, they better beef up security and check IDs, because no doubt some 99-year-olds will be trying to sneak in. <laughs> well, anyway, I just want to say it's very nice to be here. I know you don't know me. I'm not from Detroit, but you're a very nice crowd, and I hope you had a good time, and I hope you have a nice time tonight, and thanks very much, and good luck in 85, but watch out for the Yankees. Good night. for the head table. Boy, us baseball guys, we love chewing tobacco. Wow. You chew that stuff? Are you kidding? Who wouldn't love to put something that looks like that right in their mouth? Mmm. Oh. Mm. Oh, that's that. Oh. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Usually umpires get the last word in their disputes with the managers. Tonight we're changing that, and the umps getting the first word. American League Baseball umpire, Rocky Rowe. Rock I'm very uncomfortable here. It's, it's not, not a good feeling for me. It's not very often I get claps. So on the count of three, would you get me ready for spring training and boom me? One, two, three. <laughs> These people have obviously seen me work, Sparky. <laughs> Do you realize how unlikely it is having a major league umpire here singing glowing praises of a major league manager? It's not that umps in the major leagues, you know, can't like a major league manager. It's just like, in Sparky's case, I don't. <laughs> Our crew had a lot to do with Detroit's success. They kept us out of town. Uh, when Detroit was 35 and five, I have to be honest, our crew had three of the five losses. Go ahead, you can boo again. 
Uh, but Sparky got a chance to get back at my crew chief, who was Larry Barnett. I don't know if you remember it. I don't know how you could forget it. Larry was the umpire that was working the plate the night that got hit, how can I say it, in a rather sensitive area when Lance Parrish went for a pitch out. <laughs> I believe Joe Garagiola, doing the color that night, said Larry was hit in the lower abdomen. <laughs> well, I'm here to tell you, it wasn't in the lower abdomen. Because <laughs> Larry called me that night. But it's my theory, Sparky likes to get back at umpires that haven't been giving him the favorable calls. So it's my theory that Sparky called out to Parrish and asked him for the pitch out. Parrish gave the signal in English. Lopez got the signal in Spanish. And Barnett worked the balance of the game in Soprano. <laughs> Sparky and I haven't always gotten along, and I have to be very honest, uh, quite frankly, he hates me. Uh, before he had seen me umpire in the American League, he had jet black hair. But I went to, no matter what I did with Sparky, he would not believe anything I did. If I said it was a ball, he would say it was a strike. If I said today was Saturday, he would say it's Monday. Cloudy? No, it's sunny. So I went to one of the seasoned veterans, Bill Haller, and I said, Bill, Sparky will not believe a word I'm saying. You know, what can I do? He said, well, Sparky gets very volatile. He's very into the game. What you have to do at the height of the argument is say something so bizarre that with his mind, he'll lose track of what's going on. <laughs> It made sense to me. So we're working in Tiger Stadium back when he first came to the American League. And I went over and, and I had a pitch. And Sparky yells out of the dugout, Crime in Iraq, where was that pitch at? So I figured, here we go. I walked over the dugout, took my time getting there, trying to c collect my thoughts, see what I was going to, to say to him. And I leaned down the dugout, and this is what I told him I said, Sparky, you're a great manager. You have the possibilities of a dynasty here. I really think I could like you personally. But don't you know you don't end a sentence with the word the preposition at? <laughs> Sparky in his English, that kind of threw him off. He's looking into the bleachers, section 252, and I know I've got him now. So I start to walk away feeling pretty good, going back to the plate, feeling real confident. Sparky calls out, rock. So I turn around and he says, well then where was the pitch at, dipstick? <laughs> Conclusion, Sparky, my mom always taught me, and I always listened to my mom, that if you can't say anything nice about somebody, don't say anything at all. So, Sparky, I'd just like to say... appropriate to have uh, Mort Trim speak to us tonight, because if you think that baseball is competitive, you ought to try television news anchoring. For example, when Mort heard that Billy Bonds was doing news reports from his hospital bed, Mort volunteered to do his from a funeral home. <laughs> set the record straight on Sparky Anderson because he is not the common street guy of humble beginnings that he would have you believe and that you have seen 
portrayed tonight. Actually, Sparky was born into a very preppy East Coast Ivy League family. The youngest of three children, Muffy, Biffy, and Sparky. <laughs> Despite his fame as a baseball manager, I have to say that as a journalist, I am really intrigued and impressed by Sparky's talents as a writer. I've read his book. It is masterfully filled with neutron sentences which destroy the meaning but leave the words intact. <laughs> Remember how he describes his feeling returning from the home opener with a road success record of 5-0, and oh, and what a way with the phrase. Sparky writes, I had to kick myself to stay on the ground. Casey Stingle couldn't have said it better. <laughs> but last summer in Detroit, three little words said it best. something we're going to kick off the 1985 season and this is our new slogan for you and I want you to have the first one and I'd really want to put this on your back I know I picked you to win the pennant last year but you know what I was up to had you not won the pennant I'd have been on your ass um, oh pardon me here is the new one Sparky and I'd like you to have this first one it is Bless you boys, 1985, do it again. Hi, I'm uh, here to cover the uh, thing in the press. I'm with the Romulus uh, um, Plains Dealer paper. I've got a light meter. Boy, that's light. Just feel how light that, that light meter. And I got the camera, official camera, and and uh, weren't you on the cover no. of uh, Modern Doorman? No, please. Look at this thing. Thermos. It's very official. Well, just before the banquet, I asked uh, Joe Gargiola if he um, could, which one of the Tigers uh, he would like to be, the current Tigers. And he said, Kirk Gibson, flat out. And I said, why is that, Joe? He said, well, it's not his hitting, and it's not really his fielding, it's his speed. And I said, oh, yeah? Well, I said, why, why his speed? He said, well, just once... I'd like to be able to run fast enough to feel the wind through my hair. <laughs> from, from NBC Sports, here is Joe Gargiola. Joe. A salute to excellence, I'll tell you the truth. Uh, I really thought they were going to honor you, Willie. I, I really mean that, because why honor a guy whose greatest claim to fame is to walk up to you, you speak Spanish, and he says, bail me out, bail me out. Uh, if you were here, I could understand it. Uh, but, but I'm glad that, uh, that you signed a contract, because Sparky is a hell of a lot smarter right now than if you didn't sign, aren't you, Sparky? <laughs> Okay. Well, I had to dig to find out about Sparky's, uh, I'm not going to talk about his hair or anything about his, his English or anything like that. I, I'm going to talk about his career. He grew up in the Dodger organization, so I called Buzzy Bavese. And, I, and Buzzy was with the club, right? One of your good friends. I said, Buzz, tell me something about Sparky that really hasn't been written. He said Sparky was one of the first guys to come up to him and say, play me or trade me. You believe that? <laughs> But that's not the kicker. The kicker was that Buzzy said we played him, and that was the problem. After we played him, we couldn't trade him. <laughs> Wait a minute. He played one year in the big leagues, 1959 with the Phillies. I called Bill Giles. I said, Bill, you think you still got the scout, uh, scout report for Sparky? He said, let me see if I can find it. He found it. Listen to this. Speed, average. Arm, average. 
power below average. What's well, okay, it's pretty normal. I mean, with mine, they said speed, deceptive, slower than he looks. <laughs> but, uh, so that doesn't hurt. But there was a note that really says it all about Sparky's career. Okay, arm is average, his speed is average, his power is below average. It says, a determined player, but his ability must be in his wife's name. <laughs> <laughs> Let me give you his stats. He played, everybody talked about 211. That's not accurate. I have the accurate stats and you can look them up, okay? He played in 100, this is 1959 with the Phillies. He played 152 games. He went to bat 477 times, had nine doubles, two, uh, three triples, no home runs, and hit 218. Pretty good, huh? Now this took some doing. Uh, not what he did, I mean what I did. <laughs> I looked this up with the Sporting News. I can verify this. I found only two people in the entire organization, the Tiger organization, only two people who spent as much time on the field as Sparky did in 1959 and had incomparable years. You know who they were? Reno Bertoya <laughs> and Herbie the groundskeeper. <laughs> Incredible! So that was my research on that. I read his book the hardcover edition. And I want to congratulate you, Sparky, for being able to write a book before you could read. <laughs> <laughs> they said that about me, that's why I used it on him. But um, I've sat here, the night is long, and I thought to myself, how can you really sit there and insult a man that you genuinely admire? Uh, I know him as a broadcaster now, and, and, and he gives you answers that that sometimes uh, well, he can talk two hours on anything, as you well know. Four hours if he knows something about it. But uh, <laughs> I don't think you can measure Sparky with wins and losses. I think that I have been with Sparky Anderson on two of the great days of his life, uh, both World Series, and I watched him, and he reacted the same way. When you are in this business, I think you realize, and I say business, uh, baseball and television business, you realize that fame is a spotlight like it's on us right now. And it's a spotlight one minute and it's a bullseye the next. And it takes a man to be able to handle that situation. I've seen the little boy jump out in Sparky and I've seen that man. In Cincinnati when he won the World Series, in 1975, and it was a great World Series, he kept talking about a friend of his, a car dealer, who gave him a job when times were tough, and that this man was not there to uh, share in this great moment. Sparky wanted to share that moment with him. And this year, he wanted to share the moment with another man, his daddy. And I think if you get this book, You'll learn more about Sparky when you read on page 62. I know why I love Daddy so much. He had no education and he was only a laborer. But everything he did, he did for his family. Here I am on the top of the baseball mountain, but without this one man who never went to school and never had any money, I would never be where I am. But Daddy's up with God. He never hurt a soul. He always told me, be nice to people. It'll never cost you a dime. Courtesy and honesty are free. Simplicity is the sign of greatness. And meekness is the sign of true strength. We've taken a lot of good-natured shots at Sparky tonight, but that's just the way it is, because that's the way he would like it. But the little boy in Sparky and the man in Sparky are both wrapped in class. And if you have class, you don't need much of anything else. And if you don't have it, no matter what else you have, it doesn't make much difference. Sparky Anderson has class. I'm here with the 
official uh, 84 Tigers uh, World Series watches? They get rings. Oh, really? Well, oh, maybe I'll give these to Cleveland Indians. They never get anything, you know that. Bill Hill is one of Detroit's uh, top cops and star of the hit movie Beverly Hills Cop. If you don't count Eddie Murphy. <laughs> now, uh, Gil is being considered for a role in the sequel to that movie. And also, he has just signed to star in a new science fiction movie set right here in Detroit called Revenge of the People Mover. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, here is Top Cop Gil Hill. It is indeed an honor to be here tonight for the benefit of these hospitals and to pay tribute to Sparky Anderson. And although everybody thinks I'm here tonight because of my role in the movie Beverly Hills Cop, I'm really here as a Detroit homicide detective. <laughs> I figure if Sparky decides to murder the English language, I'm going to confiscate this microphone as evidence. <laughs> Sparky Anderson was my inspiration for the movie. In my big scene, I had to chew out Eddie Murphy, who had just signed a multi-million dollar contract with Paramount. But how do you chew out a guy making this kind of money? It's easy. I just pretended I was Sparky chewing out Willie Hernandez. <laughs> Every place I go, people keep asking me, what's Eddie Murphy like? What's Eddie Murphy like? Hell, he's just like any other kid worth $25 million. <laughs> <clears throat> but I was tough with him. I let him know he couldn't buy my friendship. But I did allow him to rent it for a couple of weeks. <laughs> but the movie was a lot like the Tigers World Series victory. Both were very exciting. Both brought worldwide attention to Detroit, and both destroyed a number of Detroit police cars. <laughs> In all sincerity, Sparky, every time I've ever heard you speak, the one thing that comes through quite clearly is the fact that you are a good and sincere person. And I want to thank you for myself and most Detroiters for giving us another reason to stick our chests out. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Gil. In addition to his frequent Tonight Show appearances, uh, comedian Robert Wall has worked with Paul Anka, Donna Summers, and Smokey Robinson. And he wrote for the critically acclaimed TV show, Police Squad, which one network executive described as too intelligent for mass audiences. <laughs> one thing I've never worried about with my show. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, here's comedian Robert Wall. Thank you. Thank you very much. A round of applause for your host and MC, Mr. Dick Parton. Dick Parton. Great job. Great job. It's a thrill for me to be here, and I'm a big sports fan. I'm very much into athletics. So this morning, I got up 6 a.m., put on my designer sweats, stretched out, loosened up, went for a six-mile drive. <laughs> <laughs> uphill. Uphill. I don't have to drive by joggers and tick them off, you know. Uh-uh. <laughs> I was in San Francisco. San Francisco's a great city, but it's now, if you don't know, by the way, it's 30% gay. 30%. 30%. You know what 30% means? It means you look to your left, you look to your right. If they're not gay, you are. <laughs> Already got the pen on that one, huh, Garagiola? <laughs> 
There's a lot of similarities between baseball. I don't, this is for children's hospitals and, uh, and mom hospitals. I'm very proud of that uh, because uh, I, there are a lot of people from the medical profession here tonight. We give yourself a round of applause if you're here from the medical profession, anybody here, because uh, they do a lot of good. And it's interesting because there are differences, though, of course, between the two professions. I mean, uh, if you fail 70% of the time in baseball, you're a star. You're hitting 300. You fail 70% of the time, you become a star. In medicine, no, no. <laughs> I mean, if you fail 70% of the time in medicine, you do not become a star. You become chief of staff. <laughs> I got to tell you, this is, a great, this is my second great thrill within a month. Uh, uh, the other thing I got to do was I, was I was on The Tonight Show, and I was on with the new Miss America. The new improved <laughs> Miss America. Actually, I kind of liked Vanessa Williams. I was kind of hoping to meet her. Did you ever see the pictures of Vanessa Williams? In Nice girls. <laughs> Do you think she should have given up her crown, though? I, I was a big story. I, I don't think she should have given up the crown for these pictures. I mean, do you ever see some of the pictures that Reagan made before he was elected? <laughs> I mean, her pictures were PG. His were PU. <laughs> oh, by the way, this has nothing to do with anything. But today, the Russians ticked me off. They, they ticked me off. Not, not personally. <laughs> no, they upset me today because I don't know if you saw this. They said that Reagan, President Reagan, as opposed to the girl from The Exorcist, Reagan. Didn't Reagan. <laughs> People get them confused, you know. Now they said that Reagan was a risk to have been re-elected as president. That at his age, he, he, he's a risk to live out his term. The Russians said this. Now, I wouldn't, uh, they shouldn't fight with Reagan, because Reagan's not afraid of a good, fair fight, right? Like uh, USA versus Grenada, huh? Wonder which way that one was going to go, huh? <laughs> hey, it was nip and tuck there for a while, those first few days. Those first few days, I'll bet you were scared of that Grenada Navy coming up the Detroit River, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, one, the one thing that's uh, kind of nice about this whole thing is that uh, we're honoring a man who's... Uh, had great baseball statistics. He hit no home runs. He had 34 RBIs. He batted 211. These stats make a Raggiola look like a Hall of Famer. <laughs> <laughs> but he did have a great career. First at Cincinnati. <sighs> what a city to live in. Oh, you should just get an award just for living in Cincinnati, boy. You ever been there? It's like Cleveland without the glitter. <laughs> But he did manage the dominant team in the dominant division in baseball, and uh, it is the best sport, baseball, because it's the only great, uh, it's the only team game that is not played by a clock. And that in and of itself makes it the most poetic, artistic game. And this man does it more poetically and artistically than anybody else I know. Congratulations to Mr. Sparky Anderson. <laughs> Monahan always wanted to play for the Tigers, but it didn't work out. So he did the next best thing, and he bought the team. And you realize, of course, that Tom Monahan is the only baseball owner in the history of baseball who has never been out of first place. Ladies and gentlemen, Tom Monahan. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You know, uh, the past year and a half, people have been asking me, uh, what's it like to own the Detroit Tigers? And despite the fact I've been asked this question countless times, I still can't come up with an answer that, uh, that, uh, that uh, expresses uh, my feelings. Now, I get asked the question, what's it like to win the World Series in your first year? And again, I simply can't come up with, a, with an answer that expresses uh, what a, what a feeling this is. I just don't know why I've been so fortunate and so lucky. I know that Sparky's had something to do with it. That's why I'm here tonight. I know that I've been given a lot, and I know that I owe a lot. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Tom. Tom did a very short speech because he just found out they ran out of pepperoni in Southfield, so he'll be leaving. <laughs> The left handed sparky one. Oh, um, no, really. And boy, it can be dexterous, too. Right, right hand. Well, come August, you're going to. Ow! Every morning during the 84 season, when the team was on the road, Sparky and Ernie Harwell would go out for a walk in whatever city they happened to be in for three miles, anyway, up to eight miles. You realize you folks have paid $125 tonight to honor a streetwalker. <laughs> And here's his street-walking buddy, Hall of Fame broadcaster, Ernie Harwell. Ernie? Sparky Anderson, I salute you tonight, not because you are a great manager and a winning manager, but because you have concern and compassion for your players and for everybody else. I first found out about the Sparky's compassion for his players in the 1970 World Series. That was Sparky's first year managing in the big leagues. He managed the Cincinnati Reds into the World Series against Baltimore. And on that team, Sparky had a second string journeyman catcher named Pat Corrales, 29 years old in the 14th year of a mediocre career and just about at the end of the trail. And Pat Corrales' ambition was to appear in a World Series. He'd never had a chance. The first four games of the World Series went by, Baltimore leading three games to one. Pat Corrales still was sitting on the bench. When your lifetime batting average is about 200 and the first string catcher is Johnny Bench, you don't get to play too often. Well. Baltimore got ahead in the fifth game, which turned out to be the final game of the World Series. The ninth inning rolled around. The Orioles were leading Cincinnati 9-3. to three. Pat Corrales still had not realized his ambition of being in a World Series. The first two red batters in that ninth inning went out with ease. Pat Corrales was sitting on the bench. Sparky Anderson then made a remarkable move. He looked down the dugout and he summoned Pat Corrales to come to bat for the Reds' leading hitter, Hal McRae. He knew that this would be the only chance that Pat Corrales would ever have to appear in a World Series. Corrales came to bat for McRae. He grounded out. The World Series is over, but Corrales had realized his ambition of being in the World Series thanks to a thoughtful and compassionate manager, Spark Young. Sparky is my walking companion. You have won a permanent spot in my heart. You're a true friend. You've got a lot of great qualities. You're a winner. You're a champion. But the quality about you that I admire the most is that you are very caring and you love people. God bless you. The Tigers uh, have some great batters. But in Detroit, there is only one man who can truly be described as our designated hitter. Ladies and gentlemen, the WBC Super Welterweight Champion of the World, Thomas Hearns. I made it. Well, I'm very proud to be up here today to see Sparky cool, calm, collected for a change. Notice um, when I used to see Sparky, he used to be just, you know, all aroused, can't get himself together, always running up and down, they're dying, hollering at the, the judge, the referees, or whatever. Um, <laughs> umpires, what have you. <laughs> I know it's got something to do with that. But anyway, I'm here for a special reason tonight. To con congratulate you, Sparky, on bringing a world championship to Detroit. Sparky, just remember in boxing what we say to, to each other. You can win a title, but it takes a real champ to keep it. Good luck in 1985. 
Now they'll take this with me. Thank you, Thomas. Thomas originally wasn't scheduled to speak tonight, but nobody at Channel 4 had the nerve to tell him, so he's... Uh... <laughs> When Dick Williams was the manager of the Montreal Expos, in a game versus the Phillies, he ordered an intentional walk to Bake McBride, which loaded the bases. Mike Schmidt, third baseman, then laced a single to win the game for the Phils. Later, a reporter asked Dick about his strategy. And Dick said, I don't care if Jesus was coming up, I was gonna walk McBride. And the reporter said, well, uh, what if uh, Babe Ruth was coming up? And Dick said, I don't know about Babe Ruth. <laughs> Padres manager, Dick Williams. When I came out here today, oh, I've had phone calls uh, the last week uh, making sure I'd be here. Sparky picked me up at a limous uh, with a limousine, making sure I'd be here. Uh, he said he'd hope to see me next year and pick me up in a limousine to make sure I got here. <laughs> they said, you have three minutes to say things about Sparky, but this is a toast, not a roast. I said, well, you're giving me about the same length of time as my pitchers had with your hitters during the World Series. <laughs> it's good to win, isn't it? You have a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of people talking to you after you win. Have you ever had one that didn't cash their World Series check? No, I haven't either. <laughs> but let me tell you one thing. It's tough to repeat. You repeated at Cincinnati. I repeated at Oakland. I was fired at Boston. You were fired at Cincinnati. <laughs> three years no one has repeated in their division no one no one remember you don't have a dynasty I don't have a dynasty out of San Diego I, I don't have anything after you finish with me this year <laughs> but just remember spark don't get too complacent you were a manager of the year one year, and two years later you were fired, right? <laughs> I've managed in five different cities, including Montreal and Toronto. I'm not only running out of clubs to manage, I'm running out of countries to go to. <laughs> George, I didn't purposely miss your golf tournament this year. Yes, I did. <laughs> because I knew I was coming here, and I couldn't stand you and your people getting on me again and again and again. So I'll see you next year, right here in Detroit. I'm going to bring my own fire department, <laughs> my own police department, <laughs> and maybe a little better ball club than we had last time. God bless you, Sparky. I love you. Yeah, Bobby, I'm passing the, uh... Hey, old man, right? Where are you going? Well, I, I work here. What do you do? I'm the, uh, I'm the white man. <clears throat> oh, come on. Uh, come no, on, let me no. in, would you? No. You know, I'll, I'll give you a beer. You want uh, two no. beers? No. Yeah, you know, the deposit's all paid up on these. You, you put that into an IRA account, you've got something to tax time, huh? Former baseball writer for the Detroit Free Press, now a general columnist for the Detroit News, Mr. George Cantor. George? <laughs> Well, thank you, Dick, and thank you, everybody. You know, I was delighted when they asked me back this year to join in the tribute to Sparky Anderson, not only because I'm a Detroiter born and bred and was thrilled out of my mind, like all of you, about what happened last year, but because I have such a respect for big league managers. They have a tough, tough job. I've been watching managers for a long time now, from my apprenticeship in the center field bleachers to the press box, from Connie Mack to Casey Stengel to Mayo Smith. And there's still a lot about them that I haven't quite figured out. For example, 
Why don't they sit down? <laughs> you know, the only other guys who have to stand up are the umpires. And maybe that's why managers and umpires are always fighting. You know, if I had to stand up through 162 ball games a year, I'd be looking for somebody to fight with, too. <laughs> but seriously, I'm delighted to be here to pay tribute to a man who reminded an entire city that hoping is not a futile exercise and that sometimes the good guys do win in the end. The only complaint I have is, why does he have to use a name like Sparky when he's got a wonderful first name like George? <laughs> Thank you, George. Not every George has changed his name. He's the father of our country, Sparky Washington. That'd be a throw in. <laughs> I'd like to introduce the uh, world champion Tigers who are with us tonight. First of all, a new Tiger, Walt Terrell, the newest member of the Tigers. And uh, Walt. Most of the uh, guys around the table have spent most of the evening telling Walt that uh, this evening is a typical team meal. So, <laughs> welcome, Walt. Enjoy your stay. Dan Petrie, one of the backbones of the Tiger Pitching Corps. <laughs> Marty Castillo. Marty. Marty's been very nervous tonight ever since he did the, late, uh, the Little Caesars commercial last year, if you recall, on television. He's been concerned about the reaction of Mr. Monaghan. And, and Tom told him it was, no, it was no big deal. And it's simply due to budget cutbacks, really, that he has to catch this year without a mask. So, <laughs> And next we have Daryl Evans. Daryl. Daryl is the player rep and is the highest paid Tiger... Excuse me. Excuse me. Uh, pardon me, Willie. <laughs> I'm sorry, Willie. I made these cards up a couple weeks ago. I'm... Uh, excuse me, Daryl. Willie Hernandez. Willie? <laughs> Chet Lemon. Chet? Chet, of course, uh, gave no meaning to the old expression, keep your eye on the ball. <laughs> when he tried to catch a fly ball with his face out in California. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the 1984 World Champion Tiger. I'd like to thank the Academy, my producer. <laughs> I've always wanted to do that. <laughs> well, I definitely have a keen eye for the obvious. I've been watching these people up here all night. Tommy Hearns is definitely the best dressed. Mort is not. That's a bad tie, Mort. It's a real bad tie. How many have seen the light beer commercials? Raise your hands, huh? Everybody? All right, we can take the beer bottles out of the way. We do realize that. But, <laughs> but we have, we have a kind of a special contribution to Sparky Anderson. There's a little incident that happened after the American League East Championship. You know, we were all partying and things got out of hand. You know, Gibby gets a little carried away. <laughs> nah, not Gibby. Well, Sparky accidentally jumped into a, a bottle and he cut his head. I thought he was a punk rocker because he was all red. <laughs> but we finally came up with something for Sparky. So the next time we win a world championship, or we any, any kind of championship, this is Sparky's party helmet. <laughs> so much to you, Sparky.
hand for the world champion Detroit Tigers. George Kell uh, couldn't be with us here this evening. Uh, George, of course, was one of last year's honorees and is a Hall of Famer. Uh, so we figured out a way for George to be here through videotape, and we'd like you to watch your screens at home right now for Mr. George Kell. Archie, my man, and you are my main man. I know what you're going through at this very moment because I sat there last year, and I can assure you that this is for a very great cause, and it's going to be very rewarding to you. Now, I hate to get up here and tell you this, because you're spoiled rotten anyway because of all the praise and well-deserved praise, I might add, coming your way. But little man, this might have been your finest job of managing yet, and you've had some great years. Now, I know about all those great years in Cincinnati, those back-to-back -back pennants you had over there in world championships in 1975 and 1976, but Sparky, I think those were more established ball clubs you had in Cincinnati. This year, you took a young, hungry ball club that wanted to win very much, but also a ball club that was not exactly sure what they would do when it came right down to the zero hour. But with your gentle but firm hand, you guided them through the storm like a professional. Come to think of it, Sparky, that's what you are, a professional all the way. So God bless you. I hope you repeat again in 1985. Baseball needs more people like you, Sparky Anderson. WDIB TV baseball color commentator, member of the 68 World Championship Tigers, all-star right fielder, member of the Hall of Fame, Al Kaline. Everybody, it's great to be back here again to help honor Sparky Anderson, pay tribute to him. But let's not forget the real reason we are here is for two great hospitals to benefit uh, Children's Hospital and the C.S. Mott Hospital. And boy, that's, that's saying it all when you can help kids. There's nothing better than to help kids. Time is getting, getting late. And my mother always told me, if you want people to love you, to get up and say hello and sit back down. Sparky Anderson, you're the finest manager I've ever seen here in Detroit. I wish I would have had the opportunity to play under you. You're a credit to the game of baseball. You're a credit to the Tigers. And we love you all. Thank you. worth of guampies right in this thing. Out. Some chinina and uh, pierogies and, and uh... Oh, now you've done it. You wouldn't have a mop, would you? Now, Ron Dado has been the coach of the University of Southern California Trojans baseball team for 43 years. 43 years. Sparky used to be his bat boy. Now, Sparky looks older than Rod. <laughs> I, Sparky joined the team as Bat Boy, true story, when he was nine years old. How old were you, Rod? Three? <laughs> Here is Rod Dado. Rod? Thank you, Georgie. It says right in the program, right here, then and now. And I believe I'm the only one here in the room that really can qualify and go back really to the then. Georgie is his name as he was known and he's always said his mother and I are the only ones called him Georgie. And you know I have a picture still hanging in my den. It was 1948 and we were national uh, champions our first one and a bunch of guys six of them who played in the major leagues i think every guy in that club played professional baseball and there's a little guy sitting in front with his arms folded and the hat on the side of his head and the caption by his name just says georgie <laughs> well ladies and gentlemen it's just such a great thrill for me to be here the university of southern california is so proud of sparky it's true 
He did not come to our place for very long. He met Casey Stengel at our ball field. And he graduated from the Casey Stengel School of Elocution. <laughs> but the university is so proud of calling him a Trojan and their favorite son. We love him, we respect him for his excellency. As the gentleman he is, the teacher and the scholar, and the leader and the real sportsman. Georgie, we love you. Here is the president and general manager of Channel 4 WDIV TV, Amy McCombs. Amy? Well, it's, it's a, a real honor for me this evening to present Sparky his award. You can never forget George Sparky Anderson when he does touch your life. And I'm glad Joe pointed out Sparky's father, because if you've been around Sparky or read his books, you know he always talks about Daddy. Probably no one else has touched his life as much as that man. And I know it was a very sad year for you to go through this great triumph without your father sharing in it. But I have a feeling, and I almost know that Jim Campbell saves God a few seats along the first base line, that your father was watching this year and has been very proud all through the season, was there rooting in October, and is certainly there tonight looking down and pointing to you and saying, that's my son, George Sparky Anderson. So this is from all of us here tonight, your fans at home, all the children the Children's Hospital has done so much for. This is to me for you. When you start to stand, I know what that means. You want my scalp. First of all, I want to thank all the people out there because you people that paid the money to come to this thing, and as Joe said, it seems like it started three days ago. It's, it's unbelievable. You are the people that are doing it for the children. We're not doing anything setting up here because it didn't cost us a dime. And I really thank you because the children at Mott up at Ann Arbor and the children of Detroit Hospital, it's unbelievable what you'll do for those kids. I really appreciate it. WDIV. I want to thank WDIV for honoring me, and I want to thank Amy McCombs for having me be the one that, that you honored tonight because you could have chosen so many people, and I thank you for that. Dick Purton, I just want to thank Dick. I don't think I've ever seen anybody do a better job and seeing than that. Tom Monahan, uh, he has the greatest pizza in the world, believe me. <laughs> and I want to thank Tom because uh, along with Mr. Fetzer, when I came here five years ago, I never had a man treat me any nicer or with more respect than Mr. John Fetzer did. And that's the first time I've ever called him John, Jim. And, but he was so great to me all the years, and Tom is just exactly the same way, and the ball players are really going to appreciate it. Bill LaJoy, uh, I played with Bill in Venezuela, and I played with Bill at Toronto, and I just thank Bill so much tonight for getting up. He had me very nervous that he didn't talk about my playing. I thought for sure he was going to discuss me as a player, and I appreciate it so much, William. And Jim Campbell, he's so wonderful. I, I have to tell you, in Lakeland, Florida, we were going over to a friend's house, Jimmy Muso, and we're riding along it's on the golf course, and I seen a house, and I said, Jim, that's a beautiful house. He said, you got it. I said, I got it. He said, yes, you win four straight world championships, and you can have that house. <laughs> And that's how generous he is, you know, he's one of those people. And he advised me this winter, he called me one time and he says, you have five bushes right now. So I want to thank all the players and everybody. And I appreciate all of you being here. But tonight, the man that I truly appreciate the most, and I think that everybody in their lifetime, if you just think when you're sitting around, and I know Dick has, and, and everybody that's ever been successful, and I know this man has, Rod Dato. If you just sit and think, if they say you've been successful, then stop and, and think for a minute, why? 
And the only reason any human being can ever be successful is because of the people who he met through his lifetime. I was nine years old when I met this man, Rod Dato, and yes, I look older than Rod today. Thank God, because that means that Rod don't look too bad, but... <laughs> but Rod Dato did more to change the destiny of my life than any other man other than my father. And all I can say is this, that Rod is right. I do believe that I am a Trojan, even though there was no way academically I could have ever got in. Rod would have had to break every law there ever was, and he knew it. <laughs> but they did present me with the highest honor I've ever been presented. I have the honor of Tommy Trojan. Rod Dato is not only an outstanding human being, he's one of the greatest people that's ever been in this world. Thank you so much, Rod. for a very uh, memorable evening, Sparky. And thanks uh, to Sparky for allowing us to use his name and lend his name to this uh, terrific evening we've had. Thanks to Channel 4 for the original idea and for putting this entire show together. And I want to thank all of the uh, terrific folks who have made this evening a wonderful success, our speakers and our performers. The real stars of the evening, however, and it's really true, are you folks out in the room who paid so generously to be here and you folks at home who have called in your donations to Children's Hospital of Michigan and C.S. Mott in Ann Arbor. And I can assure you that the money raised will be well spent to make sick kids healthy again. Thank you, Sparky. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And